hunger. Not then. Not in the beginning. Not back in the Garden of Eden. At that time, God had provided every single thing that Adam and Eve needed. He gave them fruit and vegetables and everything that they could long for in abundance. They were well fed and they were full. Sadly, sin entered the world as they turned away from their God and their provider questioning his ability to meet every need within them. They began to wonder if there could be a better way. And they took in counterfeit nourishment in exchange. And this counterfeit nourishment left them hungry. From then on, they had to work to produce food. It was, of course, an endless cycle. They would work hard to bring in the food, have something to eat for a while, and again, of course, it wouldn't be long before hunger would strike and the whole thing would start all over again. From that time forward, hunger was the new reality. Of course, it carried down through the ages. In the Old Testament, we read of many, many hungry people. Urgent hunger amidst famine caused entire people groups to relocate to whole new areas to find food. And we know of hunger driving people to do desperate things, like even trading out one's birthright. Gnawing hunger is impossible to ignore. We can see that that hunger was a result of the fall. And after the fall, we quite literally fell short and found ourselves again and again hungry. Now, God could have just decided that it was our decision and have left us in that state. But he is merciful, as we know. He looked upon his hungry people, and his heart has been moved again and again with compassion. There are many examples of him responding to humanity's hunger, and interestingly, he often responds with the same thing, bread. And at this time, I'd actually love to just pause for a moment before we continue further, just kind of to dedicate our time of study to him and, and invite his guidance and the Holy Spirit. Let's pray. Dear Father God, I thank you so much for giving us the gift of your word. We thank you that it is a living book and that while there are stories that we maybe have heard many times, new things can strike us and can speak to our hearts and you can continue to, to grow us as a result. And Father, we just invite your presence to be here in such a tangible way. I pray that each person might be able to take something from this study that will nourish them a bit for the things of this life. We thank you for your presence and for the gift of the Holy Spirit. We leave all of these things with you and pray in Jesus' precious name. Amen. So I've recently been blessed to be a part of a year-long study of the book of Matthew. Um, it, was, it, it was a wonderful blessing to be able to have that full year to just really dive into what had often been thought of, and I think by many is thought of to be kind of a familiar, well-known book. We, we know of most of the stories there. But I'll tell you, it struck me in um, a new and, and beautiful, fresh way. Um, I felt like I had the opportunity to 
journey along, walk alongside Jesus and his disciples and to hear the lessons that he was trying to teach the disciples and others. And I was also struck by certain themes or objects that continually reappeared throughout the book. And one of those themes or objects was bread. I'm sure that off the top of your head, you can probably think of quite a few examples, just even from the Gospels, of bread coming up. We know of him feeding the multitudes on at least a couple occasions. Um, he spoke about bread in, in teaching us how to pray. Um, he warned them of the bread of the Pharisees. He, it was a staple piece of the Last Supper. There's this reoccurring theme. And I just, it kind of um, planted in me a curiosity about what we could learn from bread. And I decided to look further into um, a bigger picture, looking at the Old Testament too. And I was rather shocked to find out that there's actually, it seems that there is more than 400 mentions of the word bread throughout the Bible. And you may, like me, be struck that there could be something special for us in this illustration of bread and the theme woven throughout God's word. Um, obviously, our time together today, we're not going to be able to look at that, that full scope. It will be just scratching the surface. But I think that there is still some real special... Um, matter of quality that we can chew on together. So, okay, so we find many references to hungry people throughout the Bible. There are many moments where the need for nourishment and filling were dire, like life-threatening. Um, specifically, we're going to look at a few examples from the Old Testament together. <clears throat> and in these cases, God provided bread. So, first of all, there was, of course, the Israelites. I think we quickly think of that one, right? And how God provided miraculous nourishment to them as they wandered around through the desert for those 40 years. He sustained the lives of this grumbling, ungrateful group of people um, with his merciful, miraculous bread from heaven. Twice a day, God also used ravens to bring bread and meat to Elijah as he was camped out by the brook Kareth during famine and drought. <clears throat> and soon after that time, Elijah is led to go to Zarephath. And here he finds a widow who's there with her son. And this story I know is familiar to many of you. He comes to her and says, please, I need some bread and I need some water. And she responds and says, I am so sorry, but I just, I don't have enough. I have only enough flour and enough oil to make one meal of bread for my son and myself. That's it. After that, we're probably going to die. We just have nothing left. I can't. And... Elijah is prompted to respond and say, if you will in faith step out and make me a loaf of bread as God's servant and prophet first and then have some bread for yourself and your son, I will make sure, God will make sure that your supplies don't run out. It's a challenging um, invitation there. But the widow steps forward in faith. She does this. And God um, acts accordingly and provides the oil and the flour that is needed through the entire rest of the season of drought, and they have enough food. So in all of these instances, if God had not provided that miraculous bread, the Israelites Elijah, the woman, and her son, they, they likely would have perished. It was a, a life-threatening hunger, and God responded with bread. 
Now, I want to spend a little bit more time diving into one of the accounts that I think first comes to our mind when we think of bread in the New Testament, and specifically, as I mentioned, in the book of Matthew. We're going to look at Matthew 14. Um, first of all, th so this is in regards to Jesus feeding the multitude of um, 5,000 people, and all four of the Gospels share this account. So turning now to Matthew 14, Jesus had been followed by a large crowd, and he had compassion on them, healing their sick. Toward the end of the day, the disciples came to him and said, this is a remote place, and it's already getting late. Send the crowds away so that they can go to the villages and buy themselves some food. Jesus replied, they do not need to go away. You give them something to eat. So in saying this, he presented for them a whole new possibility. Never had they thought that there was even the option of the people staying where they're at and still being nurtured and fed as they were needing. And of course, his challenge, you give them something to eat, also causes them to come face to face with their inability to give something to eat, right? They just don't have the resources. And so they respond by pointing him to these insufficient provisions. We have only five loaves of bread and two fish, they answered. Bring them here to me, he said. And he directed the people to the grass, taking the five loaves and the two fish and looking up to heaven, he gave thanks and broke the loaves. Then he gave them to the disciples. They all ate and were satisfied. And the disciples picked up 12 baskets of broken pieces that were left over. So everyone here was fed. Everyone was satisfied. And the disciples picked up 12 basketfuls of bread. So how many disciples are there? 12. And there's 12 baskets full of excess. And this, this study I was a part of really pointed to the fact that how amazing is it that God gave enough excess, enough abundance for every single one of these disciples who initially had said, there's not enough, we can't meet the need, we can't do it. And now there is enough for every single one of them to walk away with an example of God's ability to provide in abundance. That was something that spoke loudly to me. Um, so in the very next chapter, we find a very similar account to this one. <clears throat> but this time it involves feeding of 4,000 people. In Matthew 15, 30, we read again that Jesus was with his disciples and crowds have come to him. They've brought their lame, their sick, their blind, their mute. And the, the scripture says they laid them at his feet. So here at the feet of Jesus are people with just gaping needs. And he healed them. The people were amazed and were praising God. And then we find something different. So remember in the previous chapter, <clears throat> it was the disciples that came to Jesus saying, there's this need, send them away so they can get food. We know what happens. We just went through that. But this time, a bunch of time has passed. The people have been there. And this time it's Jesus that comes to his disciples with the, the matter of physical hunger. And he even says, I do not want to send them away hungry or they may collapse on the way. So it doesn't seem that much time has passed here. There's not been much time since the last miraculous feeding. And I can't help but imagine Jesus identifying this need even with a twinkle in his eye. Just, just hear that again, what he says. I do not want to send them away hungry. Well, just recently we heard, we don't need to send them away. Keep them here. We have enough. 
and then I wouldn't want them to collapse on the way. I feel like he's almost saying to them, remember? It could have been an opportunity for them to respond in faith, having seen how Jesus was already able to provide. And I just thought, how neat, awesome would it have been for them to look to Jesus and say, oh, do it again, Jesus. <laughs> but instead, they respond, where could we get enough bread in this remote place to feed such a crowd? Can you just imagine for Jesus that, that <sighs> but he continues on with mercy as he does with us. How many loaves do you have? Jesus asks. Seven, they replied, and a few small fish. So as in the previous experience, Jesus in, again invites his disciples to come and bring the insufficient resources to him. He takes them, gives thanks, blesses them, and multiplies them. And again, there is an abundance. There's food left over again. The thousands are fed and satisfied above and beyond. So I got to thinking, what was it that was important about these feedings of the multitudes? Why did he do it twice? You know, thousands of people present both times. Why did this happen twice? And why did he nudge the gospel writers to record it again because really it's very very much the same story with a few little differences like we pointed out it pretty much covers the same ground but it was important enough to happen twice and enough important enough to mention it here again it seems to me that there is something special here <clears throat> and as i got thinking about it i thought you know this was a bit of a bridge. I would imagine that most of the people that were there that day had heard of Jesus, excuse me, not Jesus, but had heard of God's provision of manna to the ancestors and the people back in the, the time of desert wandering. They knew that Yahweh was a capable and faithful God and that he was able to provide for his people. And this was um, a substance that they would really hold their faith to. But most of them had not yet made any sort of a connection between Yahweh and the person of Jesus. But now here they were, with bread that they could hold in their own hands, miraculous bread that they could taste in their own mouths, experiencing a divine provision of nourishment. In the desert, the bread which rained down fresh every morning was explained by an intermediary, Moses. But now, they watched Jesus speak this bread into existence in front of them. What they knew that God was capable of doing and providing, they were now experiencing Jesus do and provide. There is a direct link between the miraculous, life-giving nourishment and Jesus. I tend to think that this was such an important lesson that that could have been part of why it kind of happened twice. So in looking back at all of these different examples we've taken a look at, we looked at several from the Old Testament, then looking at these multitudes, let's look at some of the common themes that we see occurring in each occasion. So first of all, in every single one, there's a gaping hunger. Secondly, there's an awareness that the hungry person just has no means of providing what is needed to alleviate that hunger. And lastly, as the hunger, hungry step forward in trust, God 
proved himself to be more than capable of providing for the need that was present, providing nourishment in abundance over and beyond. Physical bread was the provision given by God to satisfy the hunger of his people. But do these passages hint at or foreshadow something beyond the miraculous bread of flour and oil providing relief to the hungry? Does it represent more? I'm sure that in your minds you're saying, yes, I know, it does. We do know that bread is a symbol in the Bible. God instructed Moses to place a jar of manna symbolizing his provision inside the Ark of the Covenant. So, as we talked about already, God saved the lives of these Israelite wanderers, and he says, here, don't forget it, I'm able to provide. Put this bread right there in the Ark of the Covenant, which, of course, represents his presence and closeness with the Israelite people. Likewise, there was the table of showbread, which was located in the holy place inside the tabernacle. The 12 freshly supplied loaves of bread represented God's ongoing presence and provision for the 12 tribes of Israel. Bread itself was a symbol of God's provision in response to human need. Bread also held symbolic significance within the Passover, <clears throat> which we know is a celebration um, looking back to how God had delivered the Israelites from Egypt. I'm sure all of us have heard of the Passover. Um, the name comes from the physical act that when the Israelites in faith applied the blood over the doorpost, they were quite literally passed over over from the plague of death that fell upon the unbelieving. This was the final of ten plagues that prefaced Pharaoh finally releasing the Israelites from Egypt, we know. So in remembrance of this deliverance, Jewish people would eat lamb, bitter herbs, and unleavened bread. Well, why unleavened bread? Some of you may know, in Deuteronomy 6.3, it points out that unleavened bread should be used because the Israelites were in such a hurry, there's just no time to sit around and wait for the dough to rise. So it was unleavened bread. So the bread in the Passover celebration that went on from years um, following was connected, it represented a reality of their deliverance. Looking at it now, we can see that the Passover feast was not just a celebration of the deliverance from Egypt, but it was also a foreshadowing of the coming Messiah. And as we reflect on the components of this meal, it's easy to identify the lamb as the symbol for Jesus. Back in Egypt, of course, a blameless lamb was put to death, and the Israelites had to choose to put the blood over their doorposts um, in order to be covered from the consequences of sin, specifically death. Then during the Passover meals, the, the Jews would also actually eat the lamb. So there was a a taking in and being nourished by this symbol within themselves. So the blessing of the lamb was twofold. There was the deliverance from death or life-saving aspect, and then there was the daily nourishment aspect as they would eat it as a part of this meal. So we can clearly see the parallels to Jesus here. However, interestingly, Jumping forward in time, when we look at Jesus partaking in the Last Supper, or really it could more accurately be referred to as maybe the last Passover Supper, as they had known it, 
Jesus did not point to the lamb from this meal as the symbol for himself moving forward. And it just got me thinking, so why would that be? Well, one thing that, that struck me was, wouldn't it seem a little bit off for the emblem of him that he had chosen to represent himself to be something that would continually have to be killed in order to be a part of this special service? That wouldn't really make sense, right? Because Jesus' death paid everything once and for all. There's no more requirement for death. Instead, he pointed to the bread, which, as we've already determined, was the key symbol which demonstrated God's ability to provide what was needed. It was that nuts and bolts staple food that was needed for that, that daily nourishment and was a statement of God's provision. And here we see Jesus, of course, God's ultimate provision. This was not the first time that Jesus had referred to himself as bread. And I'm sure many of you are familiar with these texts as well. Um, in John 6, 27, Jesus, we, we find that... Um, Jesus is surrounded, he and his disciples are surrounded by a group of people, a crowd that has come to him, and they've come not to hear from him and learn from them. Instead, they're there wanting to witness the miracle just of bread, kind of as a spectator sort of thing. And Jesus responds, do not work for food that spoils, but for food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. Very truly, I say to you, it's not Moses who has given you the bread from heaven, but it's my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is the bread that comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. He continues on, I am the bread of life. Your ancestors ate manna in the wilderness, yet they died. But here is the bread which comes down from heaven, which anyone who eats will not die. I am the living bread come down from heaven. So that is crystal clear, right? He has now tied this ongoing theme of continual hunger and an inability to satisfy that hunger ourselves and God being more than capable of meeting that need to himself. Isn't there so much hunger in this world? There's hunger for meaning. There's hunger for belonging and hunger for acceptance and hunger for comfort and peace. And the gaping hungers can sometimes just be overwhelming within us. Our sinful nature and history have left gaping voids. And despite our best attempts, to distract and substitute, we alone are unable to fill it. So some of you may have heard before the meaning of the name Bethlehem. Interestingly, in Hebrew, it's pronounced Bet-lehem, and the literal translation is house of bread. Think about that. Bethlehem, house of bread. Even in the selection of the town where his son would be born as a baby, he was identifying Jesus as the bread who could take care of the hunger that was present in this world. Oh, that was just so powerful, so beautiful. There's a lot to this subject of bread. Now, as Jesus walked along this earth with his disciples, he also warned them of a sort of counterfeit bread of the Pharisees. Um, 
In Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they all reference these warnings of the yeast of the Pharisees. Now, yeast in of itself is not bad. We're all familiar with it. It's a common ingredient involved in baking things like bread. It causes the dough to rise and is an important part of the process. <clears throat> in Matthew 13, 33, Jesus even told a short parable where he likened the kingdom of heaven to yeast. So yeast is not just bad, but the yeast of the Pharisees was something different. Something which Jesus wanted his followers to guard themselves against. He knew that it was not adequate nourishment for them to consume. Matthew 16 and Mark 8 both report of what seems to be the same incident. And it, it comes really close following right after the feeding of the 4,000. In Matthew 16, 5, we read... When they had gone across the lake, the disciples forgot to take bread. Be careful, Jesus said to them. Be on your guard against the yeast of the Pharisees and Sadducees. They discussed this amongst themselves and said, It's because we didn't bring any bread. Aware of their discussion, Jesus asked, You of little faith, why are you talking among yourselves about having no bread? Don't you understand? Don't you remember the five loaves for the 5,000 and how many baskets you gathered? Or the seven loaves for the 4,000 and how many baskets you gathered? Was bread production any sort of a trouble for Jesus? Clearly not at all. And as we discussed, he's trying to help them realize this deeper truth that he is the bread, but they're just... just Missing the point, as we sometimes do too. And he continues, How is it that you don't understand that I was not talking to you about bread? But be on your guard against the yeast of the Pharisees and Sadducees. Then they understood that he was not telling them to guard against the yeast used in bread, but against the teaching of the Pharisees and Sadducees. So here the yeast is the teaching or the false doctrines emphasized by the Pharisees. He knew that this could and would defile and corrupt everything else. Uh, it could produce a form of bread without any real nourishment. And in Luke 12, 1, Jesus warns his disciples, saying, Be on guard against the yeast of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. Again, it looks like bread. <laughs> There's a form of bread, but there is no real nourishment. Instead, it's actually just puffed up with air. Jesus knew that consuming these substitute breads with such ingredients would only bring emptiness and distraction from what truly had the capability of meeting that hunger inside them. And he wanted better for them. He wanted them to come to him and to be filled. A form of bread without any nourishment. This gets me thinking back to the Garden of Eden. There was a form of food, but it was devoid of nourishment. In fact, it was quite the opposite of nourishment. Adam and Eve took a bite of what really led to all this hunger. They turned away from their loving God, whom they had walked and talked with every single day. They turned away from unbroken communion that nourished them deeply, more deeply than the food. They turned away from his provision of the tree of life to instead eat from something that would bring only malnourishment and gaping hunger. They and the generations that followed have help, felt the hopeless ache of insufficiency, something that I believe probably every single one of us in this room have felt at some point. Sin caused them to lose access to the heavenly nourishment of the tree of life. But now, 
God again offered to them heavenly nourishment. As sort of an outstretched hand to them, he offered relief from the hunger, the gaping need to fill that empty space inside of them with the bread of life. So I want to say that again. <laughs> he, while their choices broke their connection with the heavenly nourishment of the tree of life, he extended to them the gift of the bread of life. God was aware of their gaping need for a savior and for redemption and for filling. He knew of the inability to provide for oneself what we need. We can't save ourselves. And he knew what alone would satisfy. Though we were and are still sinners, he loved and loves us deeply. And he invites us to come to him with our deepest, just gut-wrenching hunger that we know we can't fill with anything else. In his bread, he offers restoration and renewed heavenly nourishment. Not only does accepting the gift of his sacrifice or taking in his bread provide life-saving power and eternal life, he also offers the nourishment that we are needing to live a victorious life now, every day. He cares about our daily experience, not just the eternal life piece. He cares about where we are at right now. He cares about our needs and what we are hungry for. And he urges us to turn away from the counterfeit nourishment that he knows is only going to leave us empty. This morning, I invite you to ask yourself what you are aching for. In the moments of your life when things slow down a little bit, what is it that you are longing for? Where is it that you find yourself continually coming up hungry? Are you hungry for purpose? He says, for I know the plans I have for you, plans for good and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. Come feast on the bread of life. Are you hungry for strength? He says, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in your weakness. Come feast on the bread of life. I love that word feast because it's not just enough to get by. He wants to fill and then some. Are you hungry for peace? He says, peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. I do not give as the world gives. Come and feast on the bread of life. Bring your hunger to him. It is time to be filled. And at this time, I invite you to, just as we close our service, bow your heads with me in a word of prayer. Father God, I thank you so much that as you look upon us in our hunger, in our in our desperation, in our grasping, trying to fill this void within us that you don't turn away in disgust. Instead, you just stretch out your arms to us and say, come to me. And Father, I thank you that as that provision has been demonstrated through physical bread, Lord, it gives us a bit of an insight as to the provision and the nourishment and the filling and the fueling that you want to give our hearts. And Father, I just pray for each person in this room. You know what our areas of needs are. You know the ways that we try and fill those needs. And we know that you, you alone are able. And I pray that you would just let us feel you calling us to something more. 
I thank you that you are more than enough. And we just, we just want that, that filling within us. Thank you so much for your love and thank you for the gift of Jesus. And we leave ourselves humbly in your care with grateful hearts today, praying in his precious name, amen.